Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, having me here and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it is indeed a great honor to be here among such an august uh, panel here. And I've been uh, listening to all of you from the morning and I see that we all uh, share the same angst and we all really are looking for the core uh, of this uh, whole webinar is uh, access to justice. So we are looking at uh, um, access to justice to both the uh, offenders as well as the victims. So, and we're trying to use forensic uh, science and scientific methods to guarantee this justice for uh, victims and offenders. So actually uh, I see that the rest of the panel has made my job also easier and touched on uh, some of the things that I would also like to uh, stress upon here at this uh, uh, session. And I'd be uh, focusing on access to justice for victims in India and strengthening uh, scientific justice. I would say that these are two sides of the same coin. And access to justice, we all know, is the need of the hour and uh, is also the crucial uh, aim of the criminal justice system and all of us para professionals who work with the criminal justice system. So uh, I think always when we are trying to understand a concept, we need to like little children ask these questions. I call them the five W's and one H. We need to ask who is responsible to guarantee this access to justice and uh, when do we intervene and where do we uh, begin and uh, why is it needed at this uh, juncture and what is our role as uh, uh, paraprofessionals and professionals in the criminal justice system. And finally, the big H, how do we go about doing this? So we need to first look at our goal in the global perspective. We know that India has ratified this, um, uh, had ratified the Millennium Developmental Goals, the eight Millennium Developmental Goals, and now the UN Sustainable Developmental Goals, we call the SDGs. So I would say the focus of uh, on goal 16, peace and justice. This is exactly what we are all trying to do in our professions, in our own ways. We are trying to guarantee peace and justice. Without that, development is not possible and definitely sustainable development is a huge challenge if we don't focus on uh, these two. So we need to uh, fit our goal as criminal justice professionals, as professionals working in the criminal justice system in India into this larger global goal, goal number 16, peace and justice. So we're all in a way doing our bit so that our country does achieve this goal number 16 by 2030. So in this context, when we say access to justice, it is first mentioned in the UN declaration on basic principles of justice for victims of crime and abuse of power in 1985. And uh, are the slides changing? Can you see that? If yeah. Somebody could... Yes, okay, thank yeah, you. Can see. So uh, uh, this declaration I think is very, very important, uh, even more than the human rights uh, declaration, which we are all aware of. We all know about the UDHR, but none of us have uh, are really aware about this declaration because this has two parts, which actually deals with victims of crime and with victims of abuse of power. So what we call human rights when the offenders are, uh, the third degree methods are used. So this is a very comprehensive uh, um, declaration, but it is sadly still a declaration and we still do not have any of these uh, things in place in our country because unless it becomes a convention. So the World Society of Victimology and the Indian Society of Victimology are trying to get a convention in place so that it would be legally binding. We all know the difference between a declaration and a, a convention. So one is legally binding, like the fundamental uh, rights in our constitution. So this is where access to justice is mentioned. And we all know why there is a decrease in the reporting of crime 
there is an increase in the dark figures of crime. And we have the NCRB figures, the National Crime Records Bureau uh, gives us figures about the number of crimes, about the number of acquittals, about the number of convictions. And we all know that this figure of the number of crimes is not really the true figure. A large bit of the crimes are unreported and they lie under the sea level. So we need to strengthen our system and encourage the reporting of crime. So this is largely what all of us were talking about. We are trying to increase the reporting. We are trying to increase the faith that the victims and uh, the offenders have in the criminal justice system. And to do this, now we are living in a scientific world, a technological world. So how do we do this? And us, as part of the National Forensic Science University, I'm very proud to be part of this university and we see what we can do uh, to contribute to achieving this access to justice for victims in India. So when I say the two sides of the same coin, I see that we can, with the scientific investigations, with the scientific procedures, um, ensure that there are less number of acquittals due to lack of evidence. And also we can reduce the wrongful conviction as well because scientific evidence does not lie. So these are the two uh, things that we can do with the introduction of uh, forensic uh, uh, scientific methods in the criminal justice system. So here I'd like to, I don't know how many of you have heard of these three people, Brent Turvey, Wayne, Wayne Patrick and Andy Williams. They have coined uh, different subjects like forensic victimology. It's very, very interesting now in our NFSU, we are introducing this subject and trying to uh, get the police officers and the judicial officers and the scientists familiarized with this uh, concept. So how forensic uh, victimology, which is an applied discipline, how it examines and interprets victim evidence and helps in uh, investigations. And also it helps to support, refute allegations of victimization. We have a huge challenge in our system now with the number of fake cases. We've seen that in the SCST Act. We've seen that in the Domestic Violence uh, Act. And now we're seeing that with the POXO Act as well, how uh, people are using this uh, very, very uh, important act. We all know how uh, much the country struggled to have uh, effective acts in place like this and to see the misuse of this act, which is really a sad thing. So here also, the forensic victimologists can, talking to the victims or the alleged victim, find out whether it's a true case or not. So you see how they help in the investigation of cases, how they uh, establish an investigative suspect pool. So these uh, three people I've just spoken about, they have written textbooks on forensic victimology. How do we help detecting the false cases in this um, area as well? And also the word forensic criminology, we are introducing another course called the forensic criminology also. So this word was first used by Dr. Gross and he's called as the grandfather of forensic victimology. So it, uh, it includes things as criminalistics and criminal profiling also. So it started uh, way back and very clearly in the books that I've mentioned here, uh, the criminal investigation and in criminal psychology, he has clearly given the various steps of the general investigation of the crime, the scientific examination of physical evidence, and also the classification of criminal behavior and the uh, criminal motivations and the causes of crime as well. So these are concepts that we use in this um, uh, university to try to bring back the balance to the system and try to give everyone an access to justice with the use of forensic uh, evidence and scientific evidence. So uh, what is this? We use this clinical uh, specialities in the legal system, be it forensic psychology, be it toxicology, forensic toxicology, all the ways in which we can. So in order to, why are we doing this? In order to provide an explanation for criminal acts and behavior. and this started way back in 1896. We all know when the first 
uh, lie detection, the DDT test was used. And then finally, subsequently, even in India, we the Supreme Court has okayed the use of brain mapping, narco analysis, and after obtaining consent, of course, and this can be used in the court of law. So how do we do this? We have uh, uh, lots of techniques, like uh, uh, Dr. Asha Shukla was mentioning all these uh, various techniques that we use both with the victims and the offenders to aid in the scientific uh, investigation of crime. So what we see is uh, we need to really now think about uh, bringing everyone together. We need to uh, bring the convergence of the Trinity, I would say, to root out this injustice and reduce the number of wrongful convictions and unfair acquittals. And at this point, I'd like to mention that uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, who all of you know as a forensic scientist, he was my teacher when we were doing criminology. And I remember how uh, he was at the scene of crime once after uh, our former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated. So he was there at the scene of the crime. And that was what uh, uh, enabled him to um, uh, say that it was a belt bomb that killed him. So very, very clearly what Dr. Asha was saying, Dr. Abba was saying, and all of them were saying from the morning that we need to have the presence of a forensic uh, scientist in the scene of crime. Yes, we do have them in the CBI cases, but I think we need to have them in all the cases to ensure that there is no tampering of evidence or any of those things that usually happen. And we, as uh, forensic scientists, forensic victimologists, forensic criminologists, we have a large role to play. We evaluate, we assess the psychological state, the psychologists, the legal purposes, the age, uh, the evaluations, and all these things are done by the psychologists. And the treatment also we use uh, uh, psychologists. I'm glad that uh, Dr. Abba was saying that people were worried about what is the future of psychologists. They have a huge role to play now in all the prisons after the Supreme Court judgment. We have psychologists and counselors in all the prisons throughout the country. And of course, in the consultation also, we are there, uh, like uh, Dr. Asha was mentioning, to understand the human behavior, to understand the um, uh, witnesses and the victims and uh, uh, they have a large role to play there as well and coming to enforcement also assisting with the criminal prof profiling determining the psychological fitness and uh, uh, to give expert advice on criminal behavior as well and in the trial also scientific officers play a huge role with their, their expert testimony and uh, we as academicians, as uh, psychology professors, criminology, victimology, law professors, we also need to engage in teaching and training and researching. It's very important. Another speaker also mentioned how we need to research and find out how reliable, I think it was Dr. Goswami who said how reliable and how valid these scientific uh, evidences are that we present in a court of law. So it's important that we uh, uh, understand how uh, vital our role is in uh, increasing the access to justice for uh, victims and for victims of crime and abuse of power. And you see that there are all these emerging facets of forensic psychology and scientific evidence, criminology, how you try to understand crime, the causation, the etiology of the behavior. And we also train the police officers and sensitizing the police officers and addressing the secondary trauma of police officers also, because they are also uh, 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 not above everything. They, they also are human and they also need uh, this assistance. So, and then the psychology of crime, how we try to understand and conduct research on the psychological disorders, serial killings, we see that happening as well. And evaluating the risk and developing a psychological test as well. And the legal psychology, how we appraise the defendants competency to stand trial, the insanity plea. We have an important role there. And we need to use scientific techniques and scientific methods to uh, bring about the truth in these cases as well. 
and finally victimology and victim services as well, interviewing victims and witnesses and providing training to victim service providers also on how to understand various impact of uh, um, uh, this kind of crime. Like we had in the Mathura case, everybody said that just because she did not scream that and they did not protest, that means she gave consent. So these are the things that we need to uh, remember when we uh, see our role as scientific officers in the um, criminal justice system. So it's important we need to have lawyers, forensic scientists, and criminology, all of them working together. Then a cord of three strings is really hard to break. So we need to understand how we can work together and the public prosecutors. And we need to also uh, improve our skills and knowledges in these and our knowledge in these areas as well. And trying to get uh, witnesses. Uh, they are, these witnesses are the eyes and the ears of justice. We know that, so we need to protect them. We need to uh, encourage them to work with us, with the scientific team, with the police officers and uh, help us in this investigation. And also um, I did another study, which I looked at uh, 1,700 cases in which murder cases were acquitted. So we were trying to see what are the reasons behind these acquittals. And we found 43 reasons of, uh, for acquittal in murder cases. And then we had to uh, group them into six categories. And we saw that some were imperfect investigation and this wouldn't happen if we had scientific officers with them and failure to produce experts opinion and inordinate delay in launching prosecution. Everything here um, uh, also shows that lack of knowledge and trend when you have the scientific evidence, there is nothing like it. It is um, really a very strong evidence that will not lie. So in order to do this, we have some uh, hitches in our system, like uh, the Selvi, the Supreme Court judgment had clearly said that there is a lack of uh, credibility of this evidence because there is a lot of um, corruption that was also mentioned by another speaker. So it's important as forensic scientists and criminal justice professionals, we need to wear this hat. It's very, very important more than our knowledge and our skill. We also need to uh, be honest and accountable and transparent in all our dealings. This is what will finally uh, give the credibility to the scientific evidence that we present in the court of law. So this is, it might seem very, very basic, but this is exactly what was mentioned in the uh, Selby case, how uh, it was uh, misused and things like that. So when we present the scientific evidence in a court of law, it is the judge who sits there as a uh, gatekeeper and he decides, he or she decides about its sanctity, its credibility, its validity, its relevance, its accuracy, its admissibility, its precision, and its tenability. So when we present the evidence, we need to ensure that we have taken care of these things so that the scientific evidence that we as experts present in a court of law is not thrown out. So it should be, have all these things we should remember. And I heard another uh, speaker also talking about the contamination of evidence and the chain of custody, all these things. We need to do these things accurately, whatever we do. Otherwise, we would be wasting a lot of uh, time and a lot of uh, energy in doing these things if they're not going to be admitted in the court of law. So in the US, when I was a Fulbright scholar, I saw this, that they use the Daubert standard. One of our Supreme Court judgment has also mentioned this. So when you present a case in the a court of law, when you have an expert's opinion, when you have scientific evidence, we need to check whether all these are ensured in that evidence, whether there is a basic theory and whether that theory has been tested, like with the DNA, with whatever sample, we know that we have a lot of uh, basis for that. And are there standards in controlling the technique? Are we following the chain of command? Are we uh, using the uh, sexual assault kit, which is, uh, um, uncontaminated vessels uh, and uh, 
packets and the tubes that are provided to collect the semen and uh, pubic hair and whatever? Or are we just using whatever we find, a matchbox or any empty bottle there, which is leading to the uh, contamination? And has the theory or technique been subjected to peer review publication? It's very important. All of us need to write about it. We need to have publications in that area. So these publications are also taken in the court of law. That what is known or the political error rate, we should be aware of our weakness also. We need to um, have a studies and do some research on this as well to see what is the error rate. And is there a general acceptance of the theory? Has the expert adequately accounted for alternate explanation? We always tend to just talk about what we think, but we should also give the limitations because this makes it very clear for the judge to assess the validity and the credibility of the evidence that we are presenting. So all this is hard work. It uh, puts a lot of burden on the academicians to do some research and to present and the academicians working together with the forensic scientists, if they have any uh, need for any studies, they can always approach the universities, especially a university like the National Forensic Science uh, Universities. They have dedicated teams of uh, lawyers and criminology people and psych forensic psychologists, and they have a lab that is very well equipped that would uh, enable these kind of studies. So there needs to be a collaboration. It has to be a multidisciplinary effort. And the last thing in the Daubert standard is they check whether the expert unjustifiably extrapolated from an accepted or unfounded, unfounded uh, conclusion. So we need to base it on a very, very uh, strong, and you cannot just extrapolate it without uh, giving the techniques or giving the right justification for what we have done. So I saw that the Daubert standards were used in some of the states and also the Friar standards. This also was used in some of the states. This had three um, uh, points in question. So first the judges looked at the procedure and then they looked at the technique used and then the principles. So it's actually a concise form of the Daubert standard. So we need to have these things. Also, it is mentioned in a Supreme Court judgment. One of the um, judges' judgments has mentioned about this, but we need to also have these standards. So there's uniformity when the judge accepts or rejects the evidence presented in the court of law. So now it is, um, uh, there is no uniformity. Some of the uh, judges are able to appreciate it and some are not. And uh, uh, yes, and for this, I would say that it's very important to see what the new education policy talks about, about uh, everything being uh, multidisciplinary. And we need to have the subject knowledge as well. So first, let me talk about the law. The law, uh, the lawyers, the, when they uh, go through the law school, they do not have subjects like forensic science, forensic uh, medicine in their curriculum. So it's very important. It's these lawyers who are going to present this uh, case in the court of law. And it is these lawyers who are going to sit on the um, uh, bar, uh, on the bench as a judge. And they're going to appreciate this evidence and they're going to marshal this evidence. So they need to in, have the subjects included in the court of, in uh, uh, their law curriculum. They do have the subject criminology in some of the law universities, but it is a, a choice subject. Similarly, forensic science. Also, we need to also include a law and we need to include criminology. So we understand what um, the other person in the team is talking about. So basically it is a team effort like uh, Dr. Asha was talking about. And criminology also, we need to, uh, we have forensic science, forensic medicine and law in our curriculum. So this is exactly what the new education policy is talking about we need to have a, a lateral understanding of all the uh, connected subjects so this is another very important thing that we can look at and of course our uh, university and the curriculum is very pro to including parallel subjects in the curriculum and not just a pure uh, science that uh, we think would be um, necessary to uh, achieve the degree in the law so uh, when it finally comes to it, we see that uh, there should be a commitment 
and the knowledge of the criminal justice professionals, the training programs that have an NICFS and NFS you can uh, do periodically for lawyers, for judges, for police officers about the new subjects like forensic victimology, the new scientific techniques, forensic criminology, how it can be used in their day-to-day uh, -day duties to enhance the, uh, the conviction rate in our country. So again, the aptitude of the judges and marsh for marshalling uh, scientific evidence, the knowledge is very, very important. So we need to uh, think about uh, including that as well. And the skill of the forensic scientists. Now we see that all the forensic science labs have been upgraded and the NFSU is also helping set up new labs in various places and they have state-of-the-art uh, uh, facilities and equipment uh, and many people who come from even outside the country are really uh, baffled by the amount of uh, investments made in this area because this is all going towards that one goal of ours access to justice so it's important that all this happens simultaneously and this is a good sign and this is a good um, time in our country I would say because you can see that all this is happening. So access to justice, fair treatment. So uh, there is a victim justice also and the criminal justice uh, um, also happening. And the criminal also continues to get his rights, but not at the cost of the victim rights. So we are ensuring the access to justice for both the groups of offenders and the victims. And this is a difficult task, but we are doing it and all of us together can achieve this access to justice for all. So remembering the sustainable developmental goal, goal number 14, peace and justice to all is the goal of all of our work that we do. So uh, we're working together and it is a, a, not an easy road, but we're all committed to taking that road and together we can ensure this access to justice. So thank you very much for your patient uh, listening and I would welcome questions and suggestions and Jai Hind. Thank you.